Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. I'm Lance Key, co-host of Get Inspired and Innovate, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, Edumagicians, it's Sam. And before we start into this episode, I want to share with you about an amazing resource. It's called the Educator Candidate Member Portal. AAEE provides you with resources such as virtual job fairs, a job board, interview tips and prep, resume building, webinars. You can even get a copy of the Job Search Handbook digitally. So head on over to aaee.org and create your free Educator Candidate member account today. o'clock on Monday, you know where you need to be, the Kappa Delta Pi student teaching during COVID series. My name is Dr. Sam Fesich, and I am so excited to have you all here today. Today, I have with me Amanda Jean. We have met, I feel like I say this to everybody, we've met through Twitter, and I really do meet a lot of people through Twitter, Instagram, getting connected through my PLM, and we also got to meet at ISTE 2019. I don't remember, one of those yes, yeah. yes, and oh, it was great. We got ice cream together. She introduced me to rolled ice cream. Amazing. Yes, I still remember that. It was the best ice cream ever. Um, but Amanda's here to char- share with you engagement and online learning. If you're a student teacher and you're teaching in that online space, hybrid, face-to-face, you need to buckle up, get those notes ready to go, and let's get started. Go ahead, Amanda. I'm kicking it over to you. All right, thanks so much. I always love being here with you because I enjoy your enthusiasm and I love that the focus is really pre-service teachers. So um, this is definitely good information for anyone and everyone, whether you're a pre-service teacher, whether you're a brick and mortar teacher, whether you're you know, going from hybrid to online learning to full person, whatever is going on, this is all good information for everyone to know. Um, and it's very applicable to all scenarios, not just, you know, the COVID scenario. So hopefully this is really good. We're going to talk about engagement in online learning. So first thing, the basics. Um, my name is Amanda Jean. I am an elementary educator. This year, I'm a third grade cyber teacher. And I do a variety of other fantastical things. But you can find me on Twitter at Amanda Jean 2 um, And, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Sam always sees me there and there's always a lot of great things going on. So if you're not on Twitter already, I'm sure you've heard it from her before, you should get on Twitter <laughs> and I'll see you there. Um, this all starts with our common story and our common story was back in the spring. We were all thrust into online learning, whether we are a kindergartner, a college student, or a 35 year teacher, we were all forced to do this thing that none of us knew how to do or were used to. Um, And there were some common problems that many people were facing. And one of the biggest ones was getting kids online. Um, And I came up with this idea and this mantra that I would say to myself and my coworkers that if you can engage your kids and make them want to get on the computer, then the academics will follow. Because really, when you think about it, when we're online at a computer, you're facing a lot of very wonderfully distracting things. You're battling Xbox, you're battling YouTube, uh, you're battling soccer and playing outside in the beautiful sunshine, right? Your kids need a reason to get on the computer to be with you and do something with you and listen to you. So that became a huge focus for me. And then thus began the journey of understanding this idea of engagement even more deeply than I already 
had, you know, in my educational career. So uh, the very first thing I want everyone to think about is how you personally define engagement. Like, what do you think it is? Um, and Dr. Sam, I don't know if we can actually grab participants uh ideas is there like a chat box on here there is however they can only talk ask questions so i dropped in our uh large group chat a link to a padlet um if that's Perfect. okay so i will be checking out that padlet and if you guys uh if you need me to i can drop it individually but it's right in our chat there you guys can find it um and just click on that pink plus sign it'll turn to a pen or a pencil, whatever you want to call that, and uh, you can drop your definition of what engagement means to you. Maybe what does it look like? We can kind of do what Chris McGee does with her pre-service teachers. What does it look like, feel like, taste like, smell like? You know, what does engagement look like? <laughs> I love that. Get all the senses involved and in, yeah. in the conversation. It's something that we always say to kids, so we should follow our own advice, right? So we'll give everyone a moment to write ideas down. And I really feel like there's no wrong answer. Whatever your idea of what engagement is, is, is worth throwing up there and, and seeing what you think. Um, so far, we've got attention plus enjoyment. I like that. That makes sense. Good words to uh, connect to engagement for sure. Uh, let's see. Making sure people or kids, I suppose, are included in conversation. Um, let's see, hands-on learning, uh, 100% agree. There's lots of ways to make online hands-on. It doesn't all have to be technology all the time too. What? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. Yes. Um, let's see here. Yeah, not wanting to miss a single second. Uh, I like that idea of being so enveloped in what you're doing that you don't want to look away. It's like watching a really good movie <laughs> where you're glued to the screen. You really want to know what's going on. So I love all of these ideas and feel free to continue adding them on and adding them in. All right, let's see here. I'm going to pull this guy back up. Let me give my computer a moment to think. Everybody and I'm needs share, think time. Oh yes, including the computer. Let me tell you, the computer does not move as fast as our brain. <laughs> that is clearly evidence at certain times. Um, but engagement, um, I found this great definition on an educational website that I sort of honed in on and thought this really does the trick for me. There's lots and lots of different ones, but I like this one the best. It's the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that students show in their learning or when they're being taught, and it extends to their level of motivation that they have to learn and progress through education. So not only does attention have to do with all these wonderful things, but I like the idea that the engagement is something that's long-term. It doesn't necessarily just mean right now, like you want kids to be engaged over periods of time you know, over extended moments. So from there, I have a video, I'm not gonna show it to you right now, but I am gonna say that uh, Dr. Sam's got all the info and we'll make sure everyone has this presentation. And I'm gonna say, it's something worthwhile to look at later on. And it talks about this guy Schlechty, um, who is yet another educational theorist with a long name that is hard to pronounce but that's just the way we do things here in education. And he talks about levels of engagement. I think it's really helpful to know, but it's again, a resource you have to check out another time. My keys to education or to um, engagement are these things. And the whole conversation we're gonna have is centered around these four specifics of building strong relationships, giving students choice, communicating effectively and doubling down on feedback. So for me, if you want to have engaged students, engaged families, engaged peers, whatever it happens to be, then you need these four things. And we're going to talk about these four things in three different formats. So my goal is to give you the resources you need to facilitate those things happening in many different ways. So I've got mobile device options, 
um, regular unplugged paper pencil options and uh, computer or uh, I'd, I'd say desktop options because um, some of these resources work better in certain ways. So I'll give you all of those for all of the keys as we go. So number one, building strong relationships is really, really important. And not only that, but you need to build them and then you don't stop. I think a big misconception that teachers have is that they spend the beginning of the year building relationships with their kids and then they put it on the back burner. But it is not a back burner item. If you want your kids to be involved and engaged and interested in what you're doing, then you need to show interest in them and in their lives. And you need to do that consistently throughout the year. So for my first resource, if you are on a device, um, a laptop or a computer of some kind, we are all very familiar with our different presentation medias, right? Zoom, Google Meets, um, you know, go to meeting, whatever you're meeting on. And my key for this is focus on small group instruction because I think a lot of us focus on whole group and how we are presenting information to these large groups of students. But you have to remember, not all of your kids are in the same spot and not all of your students need to hear the same lecture on multiplication over and over and over again. And some of them need to hear that same lecture a hundred times. So in order to get to know your students and provide what's best for them, meeting in small groups is a much better way to optimize your person personal time with them, right? If you're gonna be on Zoom and you can't be on Zoom for long or whatever it happens to be because they only can be on for so long before they get distracted, right? Then maximize your time, use small groups to your advantage to get to know your students and listen to them. Also in a whole group scenario, you can't listen to all of your kids. It's impossible. You got 30 kids in front of you. There's no way you're gonna hear every single one of them talk. But in a small group, say you have six students in front of you, now everyone can speak. You can hear all of them do whatever it is, math problem, reading, lunch bunch doesn't matter. So small group instruction is definitely where it's at for building those relationships. From there, um, some device options. And these are fun things. I don't know if you know this, but teachers live on Instagram. <laughs> we live on Twitter too, but Instagram is a hot ticket item. And it's great because when you create an Instagram account, you can make it private. So you can have one for your class where family members like grandparents and, and you know aunts and uncles can join but it's all private you're the ones letting them in and nobody else you know in the internet world can see whatever you're sharing so during the pandemic we did a lot of fun Instagram things where we invited students and their families to do internet challenges um, where you know we said like make goofy uh, pictures with your family or send us pictures of your pets and this is a really fun idea I got from another teacher um, meme the pets, they collect the pictures of the pets because you know pets are definitely an important part of our relationships with the students because they love their pets and they love your pets too. And they would make all the kids pets into memes and put them on everything, on Instagram, on tests. I just thought what a fun way of getting the students to be part of what you're doing um, and involved and showing them that you know, their life is important to you, um, that you took the time to, you know, share with everybody. So I really thought that that was a lot of fun. And then last but not least, um, you write a note uh, and pick up the phone. <laughs> These are my old school ones, right? Building relationships. Uh, there's nothing like making a phone call. You can send as many emails as you want, but there's something about talking to people and the best way to build those relationships is to talk to your families, to your students, to your coworkers. So pick up the phone, <laughs> give them a call and say, hi, how's it going? And that is gonna build wonderful, strong bridges to the relationships you want to have in your classroom. So those are my basics there. From there, we move on to student choice uh, and voice, which is important as well. So there's lots of ways you can give your students choice and they definitely are much more engaged when they get to make a decision. Let me tell you, they like to do that. Here are some 
great resources. I know Dr. Sam has talked about these if in some podcast at some point in time. So it's a good idea to go rewind and check those out. But basically, Google Docs has so many ways that kids can choose things um, that it's impossible to know all of them. But one of the big hot ticket items lately has been choice boards. So um, Slides Mania has some phenomenal resources for that too. Google has a ton of resources where kids, you say, okay, you're practicing multiplication, and then they get to pick whatever activity out of the nine or whatever that they want. So that's a really good one. And then Wakelet is really an amazing resource. It's just a way of collecting things from all over the internet. And I've seen a couple scenarios in which t teachers have used it with students, um, which I thought was really, really great. I know a lot of teachers use it with teachers, like we collect resources to share on there, but um, you know, any way you can get kids involved is just really fantastic. So uh, check those resources out. The next one, and this I say works really well with mobile devices just because mobile devices have things that facilitate these very, very well. Genius Hour, project-based learning and inquiry-based learning. They're all very similar. They kind of have their own things to them, but the gist is your kids, get to pick what they wanna learn, and then they dive in deep. You simply provide them with the resources they need in which to learn and discover and create. And then they go learn and discover and create. I mean, there's, I can't even tell you how excited my students are when I say to them, you can learn anything you want, anything. You can learn about space, you can learn about the Revolutionary War, you can learn about, I don't know, um, how to, you know, flip the water bottle so it stands up straight, whatever it happens to be. It doesn't matter to me, but as long as you're doing learning. Um, so this is a great thing to do to give your students a lot more choice and voice in their learning, and it definitely gets them more engaged. The next is good old fashioned crafting. <laughs> Who doesn't love cutting pieces of paper and gluing them to other paper? I don't know, because I love doing that, and so do students. So maybe instead of asking them to do that worksheet for the hundredth time, you say, create something that shows what you know about this topic, anything. Grab the construction paper, pull out the crayons. It's time to just make stuff. And that is a powerful thing. You will be amazed and surprised what kids will come up with. And it's just so much more fun that way. So the engagement definitely comes into play. The next is communication. Oh man, communication is probably one of the most important things about my job as a cyber teacher. I can tell you for sure with students and with families and with coworkers because we're not all in the same place. Um, so we're gonna take a look at a couple of options here. And the first two are definitely great options for especially for organizations, I think as well. So S'more and MailChimp are both, or, um, uh, oh gosh, <laughs> technology, there we go, that allows you to communicate with mass amounts of people, right? So a lot of businesses in particular use MailChimp and I have seen lots of school districts actually sign on to use S'more and S'more is more of like a newsletter and uh, MailChimp is more of an email. But I used MailChimp for the last two years and the great thing is you send the email through MailChimp and you have fantastic data at your fingertips. I know who opened what, when, where in the world and how many times they clicked on it. I mean, if that's not good data, then I don't know what is because then at conference time, you can go to these parents and say, you open the emails and I know, or you don't open the emails and I also know that. Um, so that is just a really great thing to have, like when you're utilizing data for what it's for, which is your information and knowledge. So these two things facilitate that extremely well. The next is these all these great apps. So we have Remind, uh, which is a texting-based free service. Lots of teachers use it. Lots of organizations use it too. I know a lot of college groups use it. Like I was I used it when I was color guard captain at my university and to you know keep track of everybody. Voxer is another communication tool, but instead of just texting, it has text as an option. You can send audio messages. And I've seen really great 
um, examples of high school teachers that use this with their students. And they like that a lot better because then they can like ask questions or inquire about certain activities or whatever. And they seem to like that. I thought that was really cool. It's also a great place to find good teacher conversations, which is nice. And then talking points, which is top of my list resource. It is a text-based app that texts families in their native language. So when we're talking about ESL students, a lot of these families are the ones that are kind of being left behind in this whole COVID stuff because they just don't have this tech at home. Like they don't have access to all of these things. So we use talking points to talk to those families and I can text a family, you know, in Spanish, it text it in English, it sends in Spanish. And when they text back in Spanish, it automatically translates to English for me. So that is top of the line resource. If you haven't seen it or heard of it, I'd check into it. And a lot of school districts, to be honest, already know about things like this and are utilizing them. So that's something to keep in mind too. As, as a pre-service teacher, especially, a lot of your school districts might already be in on these things, but if not, it's good to have in your back pocket. And good old fashioned mail. <laughs> Who doesn't like getting mail that's not a bill? <laughs> or like junk or something that's asking you for money. Um, I love mail and I love letters and I write thank yous for everything. Um, I write thank yous to kids when they make me a picture. I write thank yous for gifts people send. I write thank yous to the people that just installed my fence, right? Thank you notes make a big difference. And not only that, but just, you know, general mail. There's a great resource and I'll make sure that um, Dr. Sam has this of, the flat teachers, if you didn't see it in the uh, spring, it was like a big viral thing where this teacher had a bit emoji of herself and she like cut them out and sent them to her students. And just like flat Stanley, the kids could take pictures of themselves with the flat teacher and do all these fun things and send them in. And it was just fantastic. What a really fun idea. And then who doesn't love using those bit emojis? I mean, Everybody loves bitmojis, right? Especially kids. <laughs> kids love bitmojis for sure. <laughs> um, and then last but not least is doubling down on feedback. So the most important thing you're gonna need, um, this is you and your students, particularly in cyber, is feedback of how things are going. There's so many ways to facilitate that. First, know your LMS, your learning management system, whatever, you end up in school district, college, whatever, there's probably a learning management system in LMS. These are the three most popular in the United States right now. So Google Classroom, Canvas, and Schoology. That's what most school districts are using. And um, your LMS has lots of ways of collecting information and feedback from your students. So once you are in on those, get to know them well and know how to get that feedback and what kind of tools you can use within the LMS. Uh, the next one we've got here is just every great teacher resource that exists. Um, the thing you should know is a lot of these companies are teacher-based companies and their concern is what is best for teachers and students. Like Flipgrid is a great example. They are a teacher-based company. They care about teachers and they're constantly updating to meet the educational need, not just like the company need or the how do we make money need, right? They're trying to do things that are best for teachers and students. So these are great resources. I've got Google Forms. There's like a hundred things you can do with Google Forms. Nearpod, which is fantastic. Great way to gather feedback. Mentimeter which is a nice online based simple one. It's kind of like Poll Everywhere, but I look at it myself as like the updated version of Poll Everywhere. Flipgrid and Pear Deck. And Pear Deck is similar to Nearpod. They both work with Google now, which is really nice. Um, but it depends. Some school districts are super into Pear Deck and some school districts are super into Nearpod. So, you know, whatever suits your fancy really, there's like hundred ways to do it. But these are great resources. The last thing is just writing down things um, and making thoughtful notes. So when you give feedback, because not only do you need to get feedback, right? You need the data, you need the info, you need to give it as well to your students, to whoever. And when you do that, you should always be thoughtful to, to give specific feedback for something 
to your students or your parents. So you can do this with a sticky note. You can do this with a comment on a Google slide, whatever it happens to be. But when you stop and take the time to write feedback to whoever it is, that time is well spent and that time is noticed by the receiver, right? When you take the time and write a nice note to your student, they innately know, and you can always explain this to them too, but they really in some subconscious way know that you took the time to sit down and write them a note and tell them that you appreciated blank. And that means something, right? That helps do all of the things we've talked about of engaging your students. So worthwhile to keep in mind. Last but not least, uh, in huge key to engagement is just have some fun. <laughs> do fun things with your, for yourself, for your kids, for the families, whatever. Have some fun. This is school, yes, is work, but school isn't work yet, right? They're, certain, they're learning how to do work. So it should be fun along the way. Um, and I have one last resource in here, and this is links to everything I did in the spring with my students when we went online. And it's just tons and tons of ideas and stuff from show and tell to Skype a scientist to Pictionary and everything that has explanation as to how that you can do this and facilitate it, particularly in an online fashion. So there's just tons more things in there. Just every resource I have, is here somewhere. Um, everything that you saw on this presentation is linked and clickable. So when you get it from Dr. Sam, then you will have everything you need. You won't have to go looking for it. It's all inside of there. Uh, the last thing I have is just, you know, regular old q and I know we're kind of coming to the end of our 30 minute slot. I'm amazed at myself that I managed to get all of that in in 30 <laughs> minutes. You did awesome. And we do have a couple of questions here and a couple of comments. Um, so a yeah. couple of comments that we had over in the Padlet. Um, someone mentioned, I am teaching with pictorial or picture cued mathematics to five grade levels of deaf and, of of deaf and hard of hearing students. I am creative with drawing the shapes, numbers, and have multiple focuses. So thanks for that information. Then down here we have, oh, someone shared, I had my students make their own robots and then write a story about their robot. They loved it, it was so creative. And Amanda, I know you're all about STEM and STEAM and all that stuff, so I thought you would enjoy that. Um, Absolutely. Jennifer shares, great job, Amanda. But Sharice has a question here, and if you guys have questions, drop them in the question box over and go to meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So Sharice's question was, what tips do you have for small groups of first graders who aren't tech savvy? Many older siblings and parents do not know how to log into other links for small groups and come back to the main class. That is a really good question. So with the younger they get, the shorter amount of time they should be on the online system, Zoom, Google Meet, whatever. So you have to maximize your time efficiently because you can't keep them on like first graders you can't keep them on i don't think past 15 minutes i, th I think yeah. 15 is really probably the max 10 is probably your best bet i use um i use my extra time i have a couple of times where we do like a fun activity or um i actually like run an encore with my students when they don't it's a long story there's a moment they don't have an encore but i try to teach them technology things with fun stuff during my extra time. So like, let's say I want them to know how to use Keynote or when I was first introducing Nearpod, I would do something highly engaging, super fun, not necessarily academically related at all, and just spend a moment teaching them how do you get on, how does it work, right? But super basics. Then once we got over the hurdle of how do we even do this, <laughs> then we get into the academics. <laughs> so with first graders, I would literally, and it might even, honestly, with a first grader, I can imagine in my mind, it might take a week to really get them to understand whatever it is you want them to use. Maybe you want them to use Jamboard or Nearpod or um, Kahoot or whatever. Um, think it through ahead of time, know their, their technology, whatever they have at home and how it's gonna interact with your um, interface and guide them through the steps 
like slowly but surely to get them used to the tech first before you jump into the academics. And I think that that kind of goes a lot with what I was saying too of engage them first and academics follow. You know, right. it, it's, there is time. I think a huge misconception of education is that we have to rush through everything. Um, like we have to get to the test at the end of the unit. We have to get to um, the state testing at the end of the year. We, um, what if they don't learn this? There is no rush. I mean, to be totally honest, the most important thing is that they enjoy learning with you. And if you need to take an extra day to do that, if you need to take an extra week to do that, take the time. Like, take a deep breath, slow down. I took my beginning of the year very, very slow with my third graders. And I am so happy that I did. We're not quite as far, per se, into the curriculum as I would hope, but they understand the tech, they know how the classroom works, they have good relationships with me and each other, and then we can build on that. You know, like the, we got to do the basics first. So I guess that's a really long winded way to answer that question, but hopefully I gave some amount of important information that was relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you say, relationships first, content next. You know, always build those relationships. It doesn't start with that one get to know you activity because it's yeah. something you need to do all year long. Amanda, thank you so much for your chat today. How can we get in touch with you? Because you know we're going to go back and review this information. We're going to check out Wakelet and Slides Mania and that flat teacher mm -hmm. link and all those good fun things that come out whenever we get our Wakelet of all the content. So how can we get in touch with you? Very good question. So my my Twitter is at Amanda Jean too, and Jean is spelled with an E. It's very old spelling of the word. Um, my email is Amanda Jean at gamifyed.net, which is a cool organization that I'm part of with a couple other teachers. We talk about gamification and education. And then um, I have a website that desperately needs to be updated, but it has a lot of information on it. <laughs> And it's amandagene.com. So if you guys want to get a hold of me, um, that is many ways in which to do so. And I'm always happy to talk to anyone. Um, I yes. talk, I work with a lot of pre-service teachers from, you know, from, from your classes, Dr. Sam, from universities in my area on the other side of Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm always happy to talk to anybody about ideas or things or questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you all of you for spending your Monday afternoon with us. We'll see you next week, same time, same place, and have a fantastic week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and bye for now. And there you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more edu magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the edu magic within you.